the back of our eyes, which contain proteins that convert light into signals for our nervous system. A broadly similar process, but without the proteins and nerves, happens in the sensor at the back of a digital camera. It's very similar to how a camera works. It's only that the materials that the eye has are soft and they're biological. That's PhD student Vanessa Restrepo-Shield, who together with colleagues at Oxford University have found a way to make artificial resonance that are soft and altogether more biological. I wondered what kick-started their research. I was very inspired by a pioneering work where some medical doctors took the sensor of a camera, modified it slightly and managed to implant it on patients that had lost their vision. And what they found was that the electrical signals generated by this camera, the sensor of a traditional camera, could trigger the electrical response in the brain. What you have then is someone wiring up the brain to a camera sensor and creating a form of vision. Absolutely. One thing that I, I thought immediately was that they were having tremendous difficulties due to the scarring uh, around this very hard alien metal object inside of the eye, which is very sensitive. They were having inflammation problems. So I thought, well, if we have gone so far in biology as to be able to purify and isolate the proteins that actually generate this, why don't we make an array similar to a camera, but using materials that people have in the past used for cell culture? So what you've tried to do then is, is reconstruct within the eye something that's like you would find at the back of a digital camera, but it's soft and, and more friendly, if you like, to, to the environment in the back of the eye. How did you go about doing that? What I first investigated was what kind of soft materials we could use. We needed materials that uh, were uh, strong. Uh, we wanted materials that could also be flexible within the body so they can fit the shape of the back of the eye. So uh, we explored lots of gels, which are similar to the ones that we can find commercially, but this one we developed uh, specifically in the lab for this purpose. And how do you manage to convert the gel into something that can detect and not just detect light actually, but also produce a signal that can go into the brain? So what we did was we developed uh, something that we call synthetic cells. So they're water droplets uh, that we encapsulate on cell membranes. And inside these wire droplets, we incorporate uh, membrane proteins that respond to light. So when we bring together these um, aqueous droplets with our soft material, we can pattern them as pixels. That's very neat. So you have basically an array of, of water droplets with proteins associated with each one. They're acting just like the pixels in the back of a, of a, of a digital camera. That's right, and they are stabilized because they have this soft material that acts as a scaffold around them. Are you able to get a signal from that array that's suitable for feeding directly into the brain, just as we've seen being developed before? Exactly, because they communicate on the exact language that our brain does, so it's all electrical impulses. So our retina, our synthetic retina, can generate electrical signals uh, with light. And it's probably worth pointing out at this stage, you, you've actually developed most of this um, by, your, by yourself. You're a PhD student, aren't you? So you're at the very beginning of your career. Yes, I am. <laughs> where, where, where's, what's the next step for you? I'm looking to develop a three-dimensional version of this retina that has much more computing involved with it. So we could try and interface it with uh, lab culture neurons and see um, how they communicate with each other. How will you go about making a three-dimensional version of this? So our lab has developed a 3D printer that can pattern these aqueous droplets in three dimensions. So this is basically, instead of printing with ink or 3D printing with, with plastic, you'll be three-dimensionally printing with water, water droplets, droplets, proteins yes. and all sorts of other things. Absolutely. When you describe it the way that you have done, um, you've got a gel, you've got water droplets, you've got the proteins that respond to light, it's kind of wired up and it all works. It, it sounds fantastically straightforward, but then you think about it a bit more and you realise this is incredibly advanced, complicated stuff. What gave you the inspiration and the idea to get back doing this? I think this all come to my childhood, actually. I used to be one of those very annoying kids that always asked why. And one of the questions I once asked my parents was, why is technology so different from us? And they said, well, because we're alive and technology is inert. And I said, well, couldn't we just take pieces of ourselves and build technology that will not be alive, but that will work? 
I think that question always stuck with me, and I decided to dedicate my scientific life to proof that we could build inert materials using life's principles. And from artificial resonance to artificial reality, or virtual reality as we've come to call it.